want to thank everyone for joining a little joint session between uh, weeds and diseases. And I guess our topic today is more going to be focusing on what are some, maybe some disease issues you're thinking that post harvest or immediately after harvest in the field, and also uh, some of those weed control uh, decisions and issues that might be, might be on everybody's minds or getting questions at the very least. So I, I think for the next hour or so, um, we're going to touch on some of the key issues that are coming into our desk at the moment. And how we have this split up is uh, we're going to have Sam go first, uh, talking about some SCN, and then I, I will follow him. But before I follow him, he'll handle all, all of his questions at that time as he uh, has to get back to Big Iron. And then uh, batting cleanup is going to be uh, Joe today. So that's kind of how it's going to be set up. Um, so with that, I am, um, I guess I'm going to start uh, getting Sam's slides up and running here. And Sam, um, you can you can kick it off for us. Thanks for joining everyone. So in kind of my world, which is the broadleaf crops, we, we think about soybeans and maybe sunflowers in particular as kind of the later season crops that can still have diseases. And so if you have questions about any of that or anything else too, feel free to feel free to ask me. But I thought I would share with you what most or hopefully all the county offices got in the mail with soybean sampling stuff. And so some of you are really familiar with soybean cysts and some of you it's probably relatively new, but I thought it'd be prudent for me to explain what the sampling program was all about and why it's important. So I have a few slides of the things that we got. To, to start off though with soybean cyst, there's a few things to keep in mind and it's really, it's really why we keep thinking about it and talking about it. It really is the top yield limiting pest in soybeans. And the most recent data actually suggests that in the US, there's about a billion and a half dollars lost every year to SCN. And it's been expanding in our area in the last 15 to 20 years. It's a parasitic worm and so it lives in the soil and use soil sample to really figure out if you've got it and how much of it you have. Importantly, it infects soybeans and dry beans, but really in our area, no other crops. A couple weeds maybe, but really the crops we worry about are soybeans primarily and dry beans secondarily. And like I mentioned, it's invasive and it's actively expanding in the area. And I'll show you some maps of where it is here in a little bit. It's soil borne and it moves by anything that moves soil. So for most of its life cycle, it's microscopic. So it's not like gonna go on a, you know, it's not gonna hike the Appalachian Trail, right? This thing just moves when wind blows it, uh, floodwaters move it, equipment moves it, that sort of thing. It likes high pH and it likes it dry and it tends to like it better warm. So in the last couple of years, we've seen some really high levels. And often one of the things that is maybe most sinister about this is that you don't see above ground symptoms until you maybe take a 15 to 30% yield hit in the area. So when it shows up in a grower's field, it's very unlikely they're gonna notice this for a few soybean cycles. And that's where soil sampling is really most powerful because you can detect it before you're hit, getting those huge yield hits. So Andrew, if you could flip. So I sent, or Amy, Amy Thappa in our office and I sent, uh, packets to each county office with three different things in them. There were some soybean cyst nematode publications, which I'm gonna kind of walk you through. There were soil sampling bags, and then there were some instruction sheets. And so this, soy, this SCN publication, I'm, I'm just gonna go through, because I, I want you to be able to use it as a resource uh, quickly and you know give it to growers if you like. Uh, it's eight pages, and we just finished this in the spring. One of the postdocs that was working for Gui Ping Yan, who's our nematologist in plant pathology, and I uh, put this together. And then there's a few others in our group that were helpful on this. So Andrew, why don't you flip that page? So the first couple pages here are devoted to symptoms and signs. And I think that the thing that is really important when you talk to growers about SCN and you tell them you, know, you can go look for it, you can find this in some, some times of the year and really mid-August to maybe this first week of September or so, second week maybe, you can see white cream colored cysts. But if you look at the lower two pictures, lower left-hand corner two pictures, there's a nodule in each of those photos. The nodule is like Jupiter, it's gigantic compared to the cysts. And the cysts are the little white cream colored ones. The nodules are the big round ones. So just 
growers will often get confused when you see images like this or you see soil. It's with cysts, it's really, really small. Lots of times they need light or a magnifying glass. <clears throat> the other thing I want to point out is the upper right hand corner. At the end of the season, the cysts turn brown and they are almost impossible to see. So that that's starting right now and it's going to only get browner. And so even at this point in the season, I really struggle to find them because they're all changing color. They just look like the soil basically, and then they fall off the roots. And so it's, it's almost impossible. <clears throat> Why don't you go ahead and flip that, Andrew? So the next couple of pages are devoted to sampling, the sampling strategy. And then what's an HG type? I'm not gonna get into the HG type, but sampling strategy is really important. So you want to have them sample at the end of the season. And that's why you have new bags right now. And, and, and just, I forgot to mention this, the Soybean Council is supporting this program. And so all the sample fees are paid by for the Soybean Council. The growers don't incur any cost at all here. But there's two reasons to sample, and it's elaborated on this, but the first is if you, if you don't know if you've got it, especially if you're outside the southeast corner of the state, you're sampling to try to find it for the first time. And in that, in that search, you want to go where you think you might, you might get soil introduced to the field. So if you look at that graphic on the left-hand page, number three talks about the areas where you're most likely to see SCN show up first. And it's all related to how soil moves into a field. So a field entrance, soil is going to be brought in on equipment. A low spot, floodwater might bring it in. Or geese will come in on geese. In our area, shelter belts are super important. SCN is really small and dusty and light, blows with soil. If you get a snert storm, you're going to have SCN in the ditches or on the shelter belts. But the other reason to sample is to figure out if you know you've got it already, the other reason is that you want to figure out how much of it you have. It's the, the egg levels is what we measure, and I'll show you in a second, but it's the only way we can really help a grower figure out if their management tools are working. If they go into a field and they've got a resistant variety or whatever, and their egg levels are sky high, they need to switch it up. But if the egg levels are dropping, they need to keep doing what they're doing. And, and so those are the two reasons, to find it if it's emerging in your area, or to really help the growers understand if their tools are working. The right-hand side of this is about HG types. I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, the biggest message here is that SCN, it's a parasitic worm and like most other pathogens, it can overcome genetic resistance. It can form races, think strains, right? Um, that's happening and there's questions about it and it, it talks about this. If you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to talk to you anytime about it, but that's just a little information um, to try to get people started. Andrew, why don't you flip that? This is about the sampling program and detection. So this, these maps here and that histogram there with the, the data, the bars, that is what's been happening, happening with the sampling program since 2013. And it's really been this sampling program that has showed us, the growers, the Soybean Council, everyone, where SEN is in the state. And this is part of the reason it's important. And so the way you would read this is you, you've got all these colored dots on the first map, and that's related to egg levels. So it goes from zero to 20,000 plus. And then the color-coded dots are coordinated with the histogram, the bar chart beneath. So like if you look at the last year, the top little area of 2021 is a, it goes red. I'm having trouble seeing it, but I think it goes red, yellow, blue, green, gray. Those are all related to the number of samples that have those respective egg levels. Okay. And then this, so if you just look at those two for a second, we have maybe half to two thirds of the samples that have come in are black and that's negative. There hasn't been any eggs in those, but the rest are positive. And then it goes up from very low level detections all the way up to super high. And for reference, most universities that have been dealing with SCN for a long time, so like Iowa State or, or Purdue and Indiana, they'd say at 10,000 egg levels or higher, you're gonna have significant yield loss on your best resistant soybeans. And, and that level for us is the, the yellow and the red. 
but even if you don't, even if you have a low level, you have to manage it. And then the easiest thing maybe for folks to see is this, this heat map on the bottom. And so you can see the southeast corner of the state, to some degree, the east central part of the state, we're kind of getting smoked with SCN. It's uh, really high levels. And, and again, you can take yield loss at any level, but the higher you get, the more likely you're going to get it. And so all of these data points, I think there's almost 5,000, have come from this sampling program. And it's from growers and consultants coming to your office and getting bags. Or in a lot of cases, the agents themselves are doing a little sampling to get a better handle on what's going on in the county. Um, so it's been going since 2013, and that's what, you, that's what this is all about. Andrew, why don't you flip the next page? Oh, this is just a little bit more resource information. Maybe flip one more. Okay, so the next thing you got in the mail was the sampling ID form. And so there's some instructions on how to do this. You know, that, that same or very similar map on distribution is there, the where to sample is there, kind of how, what the growers want to do or consultants or whomever, uh, and fill out the geographic area and put your information in there and then set, do the soil sample and then send it into the lab. And one thing that's important is that I never see the submitter information. I don't see anybody's personal information. All I see is egg levels and a geospatial point to create a map. So the Soybean Council, rightly so, didn't want me having everyone's personal information. I don't want it either when the program started. So basically this goes to AgVice. AgVice sends me a database full of points that I can make a map from and that's it. But that's why this submitting, this form is important. It uh, puts a firewall between me and the growers and also gives me information to make a map. And then Andrew flip one more, why don't you? Oh, and that's just a soil sample bag. The reason we, <clears throat> the reason we have an image here is that last year the codes or the colored tag was yellow. If you have yellow ones, just get rid of the yellow, use the green ones. And that, that's only a function, <clears throat> excuse me, that's only a function of funding cycles for the Soybean Council. <clears throat> and go ahead, Andrew, that's it. So again, if, if, you, if, you, have, you, if you have interest in uh, sampling, go ahead. But if you have interest in getting this into the hands of growers, I encourage you to do so. But that's what the whole program is about. It's designed to drive traffic to your offices and the soybean council covers the cost and in you know in the big cycle then hopefully a grower would come back to you to talk about how to manage this pathogen so that's what i prepared about scn but i am more than happy to answer any questions on you know any other diseases uh, of the broadleaf crops sam what uh I'm not seeing any uh, stem diseases and the way thing, the soybeans are dying prematurely in my county from the dry weather. I can't see any leaf symptoms to help um, point, pinpoint those. Have you seen uh, much um, uh, stem diseases in the state or hearing much about it? And what can I do to... Um, search for them without having the leaf symptoms? Hi, Jeff. Yeah, <clears throat> good question. And so a couple of answers. We have not seen a ton of stem diseases. It's kind of surprised me, to be honest. We've had maybe a dozen samples come into the diagnostic lab with, with leaf symptoms that are consistent of sudden death or brown stem rot, which they are, the leaf symptoms are identical. And Nearly all of them have been brown stem rot, which uh, we have it in the state. I know we have, but I've expected to see a little more sudden death. And I'm expecting that charcoal rot is going to start to show up a little bit. So, so without the leaves or without the leaf symptoms, the best thing you can do is take a pocket knife into a field. And when these plants are starting to die, maybe not the totally dead ones, those, those get full of like just saprophytic fungi. But take a pocket knife in, this, in, the, in the field and pull up a plant and then focus on the bottom six inches of the stem. And what I do is the first thing is I'll take that pocket knife and I'll kind of shave off the outer tissue, just like you're shaving your beard, just shave it off really slowly and carefully. 
And if you see little brown or little black specks on that tissue, just right underneath the skin of the plant, that's a symptom of charcoal rot. And then I take the knife and I split the stem longitudinally in half, like the long way. And then if the pith is brown, like, like the very, very center of the plant, it look like, looks like lead in a pencil. If that's brown, that's a symptom of brown stem rot. If that's clean, but the rest of the, the stem, kind of the, normally the white parts on the outside, if that's brown and streaky or kind of discolored, that's a symptom of fusarium. So that could be sudden death or fusarium root stem rot. But, but without leaf symptoms, that's what I do. I, I, will, I will focus on the lower six inches of the stem and I'll always bring a pocket knife and start cutting, cutting things up. Sam, we have a question in the, in the chat box from Brad Brumman. And the question is, can you tell me where we are at with pinto beans and blacks with SCN? Yeah, so there has been some more research that's been done recently about susceptibility of the different market classes, Brad. And this is, this is important, and we're going to be talking about it this winter a lot. So there is a difference between susceptibility and kidneys. I know you didn't ask about kidneys, but kidneys tend to be the most susceptible. But the newer data su suggests that even the most susceptible kidneys are more like a moderately susceptible soybean, which is good news because initially we thought they were just as susceptible. Um, and blacks tend to be very similar to um, resistant, maybe moderately resistant soybean. So that's really good news too. Pintos and navies are somewhere in the middle, think moderately resistant. So that's pretty new over the last year and in it, and it does it, in my mind it, it changes the game a little bit because it suggests that you know we're going to have SCN in, in the beans, the dry beans, but it's not going to be a devastating thing, which is really, really good. It also suggests to me it's going to be a little bit harder to find. So you're not going to see above ground symptoms maybe ever or very rarely. We've seen them in kidneys on the Minnesota sandy side, you know, where they grown by Park Rapid, no, St. Cloud, where they grown by St. Cloud. Um, but with as far as distribution, wherever SCN is found in soybean sampling, you know, it just shares the ground with dry beans. So we would assume that we would assume it's there and we would assume that it's reproducing on the dry beans. Actually, in your area, Walsh County, Pembina to the north, we are operating a little bit blind. There's not a lot of samples in the maps. You probably noticed that right away. And so your, your area happens to be the area, I, frankly, I'm most concerned about. Um, because we, we know SCN's moving north. We know we've got hot spots, even in Southern Grand Forks County. And I'm a little bit afraid that a hot spot's just gonna appear one year and blow up on you. Sam, this is Jeff again. Did, did you end up finding much frog eye leaf spot then this season? Very, very little, very little. I think I've been sent a couple pictures that I think are frog eye and I haven't seen any myself. Um, yeah, just, just very little, which, which is a good thing, but yeah, very, very little. I, I, your last photo I think was probably frog eye, you know, without the gray growth, it's hard to confirm that, but that would be my guess. Um, so it's, it's out there. That particular disease, it likes it hot, which is part of the reason they have way more of it in the I states and the mid south, Kentucky, Tennessee, that sort of thing. But it needs fairly consistent rain, and I think that maybe is the thing that we didn't get to get it blown up. Sam, you got a question from Craig. Uh, Craig, you can go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? I can, I hear, can you. hear you. All right. This might be a little hard to answer, but. With soybeans coming farther and farther west out here to western North Dakota, um, is there any relation to SCN to the maturity levels in the soybeans? <clears throat> is it the, the shorter maturing or longer maturing ones any more susceptible or not? Yeah, it's it's a good question, and and yes, it is actually a little harder to answer. So part of the reason, part of part of the answer is related to the breeding process. So there's genetics for resistance in the in the beans, 
And for several decades, they've really focused hard. The breeders have really focused hard on maturity groups, twos and threes, right? Across the corn belt. That's, you know, where SCN was hottest and where, I don't know, maybe 60, 70% of the acreages. They focus a lot less on the low maturity groups. So zeros, double zeros, they kind of worry about it too much, right? So we're a little bit behind in that regard. Um, there's more than one source of resistance and it's really hard to find that second source in our maturity group. So that, that kind of makes it harder. And then there's the component of length of season. So soybean cyst goes through a cycle about every 24, 28 days, you know, in a favorable environment. So in our area, we think two to three full cycles is probably what happens most years. In Iowa, it's maybe five, you know, maybe at least four because the growing season is longer. Uh, as far as genetic relationship with susceptibility, I don't know of any susceptibility in maturity groups, but those two factors about length of season and the genetics for resistance are both at play. So in a way, maybe we're a little bit better because we don't have as many cycles. Conversely, our resistance is not as good. And so I think part of the reason is the egg levels are blowing up us, on us in the southeastern part of the state is the resistance in our varieties is not quite as hot as in other areas. Okay, thank you. We got, a, we got one more question for you, Sam, in the chat box here. Uh, this is from Greg Endress. And any relationship with tillage systems, example, no-till versus conventional till and SEN populations? Mm. I'm not Greg I'm that's a good question I'm not sure about I'm not sure about the population ex, move uh, their population levels I there certainly is a relationship with spread and that's kind of an obvious one spread within a field and then liberating the soil and it blows around so you you do see less movement with something like no-till but I am not so sure about the population that's that's a question I don't have an answer for you and thank you for stumping me, Greg. <laughs> and, and Andrew, you're going to have to cut me off here. Whenever yeah, I was just going to say, I know you have a commitment here at 1032, Sam. So um, if there's any other questions, you can certainly ask them later and I can uh, relay those to Sam and I have them follow up with you. But uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, please feel free to reach out at any time. I'll get back to you. I'm getting a little slower here just because of this week, but I'll do my best. I really appreciate your help and, and your questions. See you, Sam. Thank you. Well, I guess uh, we'll keep the disease talk a little bit more, um, I guess, extended disease talk a little bit. And uh, what I more or less want to speak on today is kind of my status on what we're seeing in the wheat crop, especially at this point in the season when we start thinking about uh, grain quality or some of the impacts of some of the diseases we have. So um, I want to be covering basically three diseases, uh, just kind of my observations. Uh, one is fusarium head blight or scabby kernels, uh, black point, and then I'm going to end on ergot. So this first picture, uh, this is from my test plots and uh, what I what I more or less want to show is that when when I'm starting to take a look at grain quality, you know, sometimes you can see this fairly obvious. And 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 then these plots, uh, what I'm looking at specifically, you have a scabby kernel here, one that is uh, also scabby, and then we also have one that has black points. So to look at for a scabby kernel, uh, they tend to look lifeless. They can be chalky white. In this one, there's a slight pink hue to it. Um, all that is very characteristic of a scabby kernel. Uh, black point is going to have a black to brown darkened region around, around the embryo. And some of the basic questions I get with black point is uh, what does it do? What causes it? And should we be worried? So black point is often associated with a couple different pathogens. Uh, some may be saprophytes, some may be a leaf pathogen. Uh, and when I see black point in the worst case scenarios is wheat that's been sitting out there too long. Uh, when you start seeing sooty molds, you can often see a higher risk of black point. And the real risk from black point is it could potentially uh, inhibit germination. So anybody that's looking at it for seed purposes, uh, always a good, 
good thing to do is do a germination test, but it's something that can inhibit germination. So that's one of the big things. The other thing on a quality aspect, it can uh, reduce to some black specks. Uh, sometimes it can, re can result in dockage too at the elevator, but really it, it has to become very noticeable before I've, I've had come across any situations like that, but very common type of black point this year. And just kind of wanted to bring it up as far as, you know, what, what's something that you may get a question on. The one I want to spend most of my time talking about is scab. Um, so first thing is if I had to assess scab risk for the state, I, I would say most of the state was under a moderate scab risk at some point during the season, especially during the heading and flowering stages. Uh, generally the greatest risk area probably that might see some scab concerns is actually Northwest North Dakota. Um, and I'm saying that from a perspective of when I'm seeing most of the heading and flowering dates uh, coincide with what we see for scab risk. Uh, not saying that some of the other regions aren't gonna have maybe a few scabby fields, but if I wanna just kind of say that the general, the general area that had the highest risk was up in that corner there for a while. And certainly with the uh, variety of planting dates and different heading dates and flowering date, dates, it's tough to really gauge on what, what the scab risk is in the crop. But I do know we're under at least a moderate risk for most regions. The other thing I wanna mention about scab and scab management is this is by far the most amount of fungicides that I saw go across the state for scab this year. And that was in Eastern and Western North Dakota. When I was out West uh, during peak scab season, I was seeing wheel tracks, I was seeing aerial traffic. Uh, there was a lot of spraying this year. And I'd say in my 10 years, uh, it would be a, what I call banner year and fungicide application. So hopefully that will help. I think that's probably why we're gonna probably manage most of our uh, scab this year. And when it comes to this point is also managing the mycotoxin, dioxin of alanol, Don or vomitoxin. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. So when I think about vomitoxin or grain quality, I think I'm looking at this wheat spikelet here. And there's a couple things I want to draw your attention to. If you have an infected spike, there's a couple ways to look at this. So when you have a severe infected kernel, they're going to be extremely lightweight, likely not to make it in the grain hop and that uh, into the grain tank. And that's probably where your most amount of Dawn is going to be sitting in those really extremely shriveled kernels. When you have a neighboring uh, floret next to it, you'll notice that this kernel seems slightly reduced in weight, but it's likely going to make it into the grain tank and it's likely going to have vomitoxin. And even cases that I've been experienced with is even healthy kernels when they're in direct vicinity to a, to a scabby kernel, you may still see some fusarium growth on the outside. And that is could also result in some vomitoxin detection. So just looking at this picture, there's a couple different ways and how this works. Certainly varieties are gonna be a big player on this. Um, the more resistant variety, uh, the less spread of that infection in a lot of cases along a spike lid and our more susceptible varieties, which we have a few of them out there, uh, you might see more of a mixed bag of, uh, of scabby kernels on a single head. So that's just one way to kind of look at it. But questions that I get at this time is pertaining to the vomitoxin values or the levels in the grain. And there's two things I want to kind of remind folks is when it comes to testing for Don at the elevator, there is more error in the sampling than the test itself. Um, and kind of put this in perspective, if you would take uh, a, a sample from a grain tank, it is likely you're going to get complete, you're going to get two different DOM levels. And it's all dependent on what sample you're, you're grabbing. So in this bottom picture for on the below here example, if your first sample maybe encompasses these really heavily pink Durham kernels and your second sample is more of the of the healthy kernels, you're going to have vastly different weight. You're going to have vastly different values just based off the sample you're grabbing. So um, you might hear a lot of conversation that I took to one elevator and then I took it to an eleva elevator and I get two different values. And that's that, that's that's the uh, kind of the problem with this. It's sampling. You just do that. You have the most representative sample that you can. But when you get that question, the test is really not changing. It's more the sample that's causing more error. The other thing is. Uh, if you have scabby grain that has higher levels of Dawn, it will not go down over time in the storage bin. Um, they remain really stable over time. The fusarium growth is always going to be there. And if you have the fusarium, you're going to have the Dawn level. So those are kind of the two key aspects of it right now. So kind of summarizing some of the scab, 
uh, outlook or a scab at this point for me in my office. I think we, we did see scab in the field this year. We saw it in a couple fields, but I have not come across any concerning uh, phone calls or uh, any issues that with uh, with some of the vomitoxin levels, but it's still early uh, in my in my perception of this. So if you have any questions with that, or if you have any reports, I would love to hear them because it gives me a better idea of uh, some of the areas that may have had uh, had more scab than others. Uh, the last disease, which I call kind of a post harvest disease, is going to be ergot. A um, couple things about ergot. We'll find it every year in North Dakota. Uh, a couple of reasons for it is it likes cool, wet weather, which is a perfect scenario for uh, the pathogen in North Dakota. And we have over 50 grass hosts. And that's that's your small grain crops, wheat, barley, rye, rye being the most susceptible small grain crop, but also includes all the smooth brome that you see in the ditches and the quack grass. And if there's one thing that I've had conversations with this year, um, due to a lot of our grasshopper problems we had in the state, uh, there was a tendency to leave uh, the ditches unmowed or uh, unmanaged to try to control the grasshoppers to stay on the field edges. And when that was done, most of the smooth brome went to head. And when we see smooth brome go to head, there is a chance of the ergot pathogen infecting the smooth brome. And then you'll see some carryover into the edge of the field. So what, what this all kind of rounded out to be is that we started to see some ergot on field edges. Um, and so I've had, I handled a few phone calls where in those cases, when you have just field edges of ergot, try to harvest and keep those separate. Uh, that's that's going to save time and money from contaminating a whole, a whole grain lot because the thresholds on this is very, very strict. And that's why just a few ergot bodies can have a pretty big impact on, on, on a lot when it comes to sampling. So if you want to look at ergot thresholds out there, it's based off a proportion by weight. So the proportion of weight of the ergot bodies divided by a two kilogram sample of 2.2 pounds. And how this is set up, we have wheat that's at a 0.05%, barley oats and triticale at 0.1 and rye at 0.3. And to put this in a bigger perspective, if we're looking at this in wheat, it's about 10 ergot bodies in a two pound sample of wheat. So it doesn't take a whole lot to, to be classified as ergoty. And I did, again, this is a little bit early, but I, I did get brought into a few concerns of seeing ergot levels in the field being higher than expected. And I'm, I'm optimistic that there were some harvest strategies in place, uh, or in some cases, the ergot incidence wasn't as high across the field and it remained on the field edges. Um, so that those are the kind of things I just wanted to touch on briefly is black point, fusarium headlight, or more or less scabby grain, and then ergot. And I would invite any questions that you have or anything else, uh, get touch on corn diseases yet, because uh, we're still almost three quarters of the way, uh, still trying to figure that out, but I, I'd be willing to answer any questions on small grains or corn if you have them. Joe, I think people want to hear about weed, just kind of what I'm, I'm gathering based off uh, uh, some of the response right now. Does anybody have any reports of scab or there's any concerning reports of, of scab in your areas or counties right now? If, it's one of, if they want to hear about weeds, Andrew, I think you're too good. Answer all the questions. That or maybe extension messaging was great that we were able to manage scab and not worry about vomitoxin issues this year. So I'll take that as a win-win in a lot of cases. Well, I'll be sticking around at the end. So um, I can certainly pass this over to Joe and then uh, I can have him go through his talk and then we'll, we'll be around until, until the end of time when, when the questions start to run out. Does that work for you, Joe? Yeah, works for me. All right, I'll pass it off. Okay, so I know we've got, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes left here. Uh, so uh, knowing that we kind of have a, a tighter schedule this morning, what I wanted to do was really just highlight some of the resources that we have available and some of the key points in my mind uh, here in the middle of September. Uh, September and October are both some very important months uh, for weed control in our state, uh, particularly for no-till acres. And uh, I know we get plenty of questions in pasture, rangeland, right-of-way areas as well. So really too many weed things to, to cover and, and justice in a shorter time frame. So that's why I really wanted to kind of highlight the key points and some resources. And so this first slide here, I, I made sure to include this picture in the background because middle of September, we're basically in what I call pigweed ID season. 
Uh, so there's not a day that goes by that I don't get a picture of a pigweed, uh, wondering if it's palmer or water hemp. And so most of you on the call here are pretty good, uh, either contacting myself or Brian Jenks or, or Greg Endress or you know, anyone who's got some more experience with pigweed ID. I will show the updated map from the Department of Ag um, here in a little bit, uh, but we have found uh, two new counties and a potential third new county this year. Uh, two of those counties basically in the last two weeks or so, as, as we're now in what I call pigweed ID season. So really the time of year when the seed heads are there and people are really paying attention to, to what the various pigweeds look like out in the field. The other thing I really did want to focus on is uh, fall burndown applications. Um, and so I wanted to highlight this page from the weed guide. So this is page seven. We have two charts now on page seven in the weed guide. I uh, added these, I believe, two years ago. And what we're trying to do with these charts is, is basically show um, different products that we might use in a fall burndown application, in this case in crop fields, and some of the weeds that we're targeting up here at the top and how effective they may be. And so for instance, 2,4-D, uh, we'll, we use quite a bit for some broadleaf weed control in the fall uh, on winter annual weeds and sometimes perennials. And basically showing uh, uh, two different rates here. If we look across the board, uh, horse weed or mare's tail might be fair to excellent control. Narrowly hawk's beard fair means we're not gonna really clean up all the uh, populations of that weed with 2,4-D by itself. And also we, hit, we do have dandelion and Canada thistle here at the end. So two important perennial weeds within our row crops. And so these, this is not, uh, certainly it's not a comprehensive list of products that we can apply in the fall, really just the most popular uh, and, and some of the cheap ones that might get utilized as people try to keep things relatively cheap in the fall. The other thing that we have in this chart, you may be wondering at the bottom here, uh, why we have Spartan, Valor and a bunch of ends uh, for no control. Uh, so basically, since we know we have two reasons for a fall application, the first is to control emerged weeds and emerged winter annuals. Uh, we have the, these top herbicides that do have foliar activity, but we also know we'll apply herbicides for residual control of some weeds into the spring. And so we have folks that may try to apply Spartan or Valor in the fall and really just want to highlight we're not going to control the emerged weeds with those products. And so that's why we have the second chart at the bottom half of page seven. And then the title here is residual weed control on, on the weeds not emerged. And so uh, quite a bit of information packed into this chart. Uh, so now you do see we have ratings for Spartan and Valor and then two different rates of Valor uh, and, and how effective they may be against different weeds. And you will see some, uh, for instance, Euphoria up here. Uh, which is uh, two group twos and then also has Valor in there as well uh, and showing how effective it may be on weeds that have not, not yet emerged. And so this chart was was basically driven by our use of Valor uh, to control kochia the following spring, but also do want to rec uh, or recognize that if we do apply Valor, uh, we'll say now September 15th, it, it, it may be too early to uh, for that kochia in the spring because we will get some breakdown. We can't really tease that out from this chart, but if we apply it and we still have a month or six weeks here that uh, horseweed might emerge this fall, we would do a fair to excellent job controlling that horseweed that has not yet emerged. So again, primarily we do want to have this Valor out close to ground freeze because we're using it primarily to target kochia, uh, but it's showing the, the different residual um, uh, activity we can expect out of some of these products. So just, Again, that's all there on page seven. Um, relatively new addition to the weed guides. We're always looking to make updates and improvements to that. I also just wanted to show a screenshot here. I um, don't expect anyone to read this, but the next page on the weed guide, page eight, we do have some narration about different things to consider uh, for fall applications, whether we're targeting perennials, uh, some considerations for specific herbicides. The top here is a 2,4-D and glyphosate. Uh, and a couple other herbicides we may apply in the fall. So just uh, a one-page narrative there, some additional considerations, some more detail on applying herbicides in the fall. The one uh, we wanted to point out uh, in a little bit of detail is, of course, horseweed or mare's tail, uh, becoming a very problematic statewide over the last half a dozen years or so. Uh, no exception this year, plenty of, of phone calls and complaints on this weed 
uh, basically in a lot of the no-till production areas. And again, wanted to highlight uh, one of the reasons we talk about this weed in the fall is life cycle. So horseweed and mare's tail, we do have populations that emerge in the fall. We can have spring emergence as well. So we still are, are pretty convinced that most of our populations in North Dakota are this black bar or the fall emerging horseweed or mare's tail. We, we uh, probably do have quite a bit that does emerge in the spring, but predominantly we have fall emergence. If you go to other areas of the country, uh, some areas have more spring emerging than fall emerging. So knowing that most of our horseweed emerges in, in the fall, this August, September, October timeframe is really when we get germination, uh, some rosette growth, uh, trying to pack on uh, some leaves before we uh, get the ground freeze and uh, those plants will then overwinter. And so this is a, a really good time to control those fall emerging plants because they're relatively small. Uh, they have not overwintered yet or, or, or um, become toughened or hardened off after overwintering. And we can do it relatively cheap, control them relatively cheap with something like 2,4-D and dicamba or even higher rates of 2,4-D by themselves. Uh, so again, uh, this weed becomes a lot more problematic to control in the spring. And, and that's why we really focus on uh, using growth regulators in the fall uh, for effective control and relatively cheap control. Now, the one thing I did want to point out with, um, with horseweed, I, no I noted that the emergence of new or fall emerging horseweed typically starts sometime in August uh, and, and throughout September, we will have emergence. However, we do need some moisture in order to achieve that. And so knowing it's been relatively dry lately, I did, I like to use this end on tool just to get a snapshot uh, of different, just rainfall across the state since we all, or at least I can have a very short term memory at times. And so I know it hasn't rained much lately here in Fargo, but since August 1, we have had almost three inches. So to me, uh, in Fargo now, uh, a shot of rain last weekend and we have more coming. We're definitely gonna have some horseweed that's emerged and a lot more emergence uh, likely to occur here over the next seven to 14 days. When I look uh, certainly further west, some of these uh, Williams and, and McLean County areas, I mean, here's one end on station that's recorded zero since August 1 through yesterday. And so I, I, you guys, of course, don't need me to say how dry it is. But to me, that really drives home the point that there's been no moisture events to stimulate germination of horseweed at that end on station. And 300s, 400s, some of the surrounding ones uh, also no, really no um, uh, germination or rainfall events to stimulate germination there either. So Next rainfall event that occurs at some of these drier areas, there, there's probably going to be some winter annual weeds that germinate. But if you go out and check fields right now, they may be uh, not a whole lot of winter annuals just because of how dry it is. So uh, certainly something that can kind of give you a quick pulse on if we've had germination to date. Uh, but certainly as rainfalls kick in September through October, we will uh, go ahead and get some rain, uh, some germination of winter annuals still before the ground freezes. So. Another way to basically phrase that is, you know, if I'm at this station, would I spray for horseweed now? Uh, no. I mean, I would always scout if I was in question, but I would not expect new horseweed emergence at that station. Uh, once we get some rainfall uh, to occur, then definitely keep an eye on, on fields in the area uh, and see if horseweed has emerged uh, in that area. So again, it, it's, not a, it's not just going to magically germinate in the fall. We, we do need some rainfall to cause those germination events. So the other thing I want to focus on here, uh, a couple more screenshots from the weed guide, but uh, so we do have this uh, started on page 64, uh, noxious and troublesome weed section. And most of these are our noxious weeds, but um, I wanted to highlight here, I pulled out just one of the leafy spurge pages because I think most questions that we'll get uh, for some of these noxious weeds, leafy spurge being one is May and June, we'll get a lot of questions about when to apply different herbicides uh, to control leafy spurge in, in May and June, knowing that when it's uh, flowering is a really good time to control leafy spurge. But this when to apply column is, is I think, pretty important uh, to, to pay attention to on some of these perennial and noxious weeds, uh, especially, again, this section has a lot of pasture and rangeland information in it. Uh, but showing that we, we do have some different things to consider uh, really based on herbicide and weed for when to apply these in order to get best control. And so this is basically all 
uh, an accumulation of, of Dr. Rod Lim's research over the years uh, and showing when the best time, if you're going to use that program, uh, will be to apply to apply that program, in this case for leafy spurge, but it does apply to other weeds. So there are some, like Tordon Plateau and 240 is a very popular mix for leafy spurge for us. When to apply is, in this case, just in the spring. We do have a note, do not apply in the fall. Uh, and that's uh, primarily because of uh, some issues with, um, with grass injury with that plateau. But also, if you're going to apply that program, uh, really the best time Dr. Lim found is in that spring time frame. So, uh, again, just highlighting different programs may dictate uh, different times of year as the best time to apply that program. So uh, we always have the weed of the year in the back of the weed guide. I did want to highlight just one. So if we go back to 2013, that's when we had foxtail barley as the weed of the year. Uh, bring this one up specifically because we, we also had a lot of foxtail barley out in the landscape this year. And so we do have that this one page right up on foxtail barley. And I did highlight uh, this chart in the bottom left is some older data uh, from up in Canada about when is the best time to control foxtail barley with glyphosate. And highlighting here that their data shows as we get into September, that's when we get the best control of foxtail barley. And so this is uh, an important point of consideration with as much foxtail barley as we had uh, this year. This is now the really good window to use glyphosate in our crop fields uh, to control foxtail barley. Uh, it is a, a perennial grass and control, controlling it in the fall with glyphosate is actually a lot easier than trying to control it next spring with glyphosate. Similar to horseweed, just, just very um, just easier to control in the fall with these herbicides prior to the, uh, them overwintering. And of course, this being a perennial, that's when it's uh, sending some of its carbohydrates down to the roots to try and overwinter. So uh, just highlighting this, this weed of the year, uh, because again, broadleaf weeds like mare's tail, Canada thistle, dandelion, we're concerned about now, uh, but foxtail barley, and then some of our uh, winter annual bromes, we can clean up with glyphosate relatively easily in the fall. Last, uh, I think, two slides here on the PowerPoint I wanted to highlight before I, I do want to hop over and show some website resources. Uh, and so kosha, again, I talked a little bit about kosha for uh, our applications now, primarily of, of Valor to control kosha. Uh, that's going to be a, an annual thing moving forward uh, if we want to get uh, some best kosha control in the spring. So I know this slide has circulated quite a bit. Um, uh, basically showing what I call a best case scenario of applying, in this case, four ounces of Valor uh, in, in the fall before the ground froze, in this case, a very late uh, middle of November application. I don't think we can expect uh, this good of control uh, most years and most fields by, by early June with Valor in the fall. We're primarily making that application. Uh, can we get some, some pretty good control uh, into and throughout May? That's going to uh, very much depend on the year, but if nothing else, we will thin out that population to make uh, our burn down, our spring burn down, uh, and able to get uh, better coverage, better efficacy on kosher with a spring burn down application. So I like that slide because I call it a best case scenario. Uh, I know Dr. Jenks has, has provided a lot of data uh, over the years, and so I did want to show where to find some of that data um, over the years on our websites. So let me kind of switch screens here. Okay, so now we're over, should be looking at a map of uh, Palmer Amaranth distribution uh, across North Dakota. So since I mentioned the, the um, data from, from Dr. Jenks and where to find some other presentations, I'll show that first and then go back to the map. Uh, so here, uh, luckily our weed science website, we do still have a lot of the old information available online. And so um, we do have presentations from the last three years from the Wild World of Weeds workshop here available online. So just wanted to show, I always just Google NDSU Wild World of Weeds to get here. Uh, so this is the main page on our weed science website. But on the tabs here on the left, you can actually go to the different presentations. And so the, the next tab I have already pre-opened for us is the 2022 presentations. And so for instance, if you wanted to see, okay, what what did uh, Brian present at 2022 Wild World of Weeds? 
click their name and it brings you to the PDF of, of that presentation. So we, we tried to keep those online for as long as possible. And then I know that he's got several years of data uh, available here on the website for those fall applications of Valor, how they look in the spring. And, and the, the main line is it's variable. We tip, we tend to get um, some benefit uh, out of that fall applied Valor for coach control in the spring. Okay, just a couple more tabs I wanted to show. Um, I showed the 2013 Weed of the Year uh, in a slide format. Do want to show that we do have catalogs from 2009 through 2019 Weed of the Year. And so as we're now in the fall talking about perennial weeds, um, here is dandelion. Um, so perennial, perennial broadleaf weed. Uh, we have got horseweed and, and narrowleaf hawksbeard. Uh, they were weeded the year in 2017 and 2018. Uh, so winter annual weeds that we can control in the fall. Uh, there's 2013 foxtail barley. And so we don't have 2020 through 2022 on here. A um, little bit more difficult to update this website now since it's on the older system. But we do have this older catalog data. Uh, if you had specific questions on dandelion, you can click on dandelion. And here's, here's the 2009 right up in the back of the weed guide if you don't have a, a 2009 weed guide handy. And so again here, uh, it's basically showing uh, glyphosate in the top right corner for control of dandelion in early fall, late fall, or spring, and showing that we're going to get better utility of, in this case, glyphosate or 2,4-D in the fall compared to the spring. So uh, some, some older write-ups, but still very valuable information, particularly as it pertains to fall applications uh, right now. So those are the resources that I wanted to show off at the moment. Uh, weed guides available online. And I did say I'd show the current map with Palmer Amaranth. So we'll kind of end uh, my narration here where we began with Palmer and pigweed season. Uh, so the, the colors on the map by the Department of Ag are kind of constantly evolving. And some of these counties do need to be updated. Uh, for instance, their, their current um, distribution here is that green, uh, is, is previously found but still detected and blue is previously found but no longer detected and I believe both Sergeant and Benson we we have confirmed in the last couple of weeks that there are still Palmer plants at some of those sites so th those two probably should be green and then as far as red uh, Hedinger and Trail County are new this year uh, Trail is about two plants and Hedinger I think we found 10 plants in the field and hand pulled all those so I think that's why they have those counties red so uh, again, for, I always refer to the latest map from the Department of Ag, um, and I, that's something I just Google North Dakota Department of Ag, uh, Palmer Amaranth map, and it's, it's usually the first link that pops up. So those are some of the resources I wanted to highlight. Um, and again, just kind of a lot of considerations for fall weed control this time of year. So I'm going to stop sharing, and I think um, whatever time we have remaining, five minutes it looks like, uh, do some some questions and answers. I'm trying to put my uh, my head around uh, um, Waterhamp and Palmer and Powell. Is there any advantage? Is this a time of year? Is fall application? Are there herbicides in the fall that will greatly enhance our our pigweed control in the spring? I mean, yeah. great, great question. So can we apply any herbicides in the fall to enhance pigweed control in the spring? Yeah. That, um, so in general, you know, my answer would be no. Yeah. I always like, you know, I always say there's a maybe in there. And so if we applied something like four ounces of Valor in this fall, you know, we may catch the first flushes of pigweeds in the spring, uh, any April, or early May pigweeds. Uh, but particularly with water hemp and, and palmer as well, but since we have a lot more water hemp acres, we'll get germination throughout May, throughout June, throughout July. And so eventually that valor does run out. And so, you know, catching the first flush may not be sufficient or definitely is not sufficient for season long control. And generally, when we talk about kind of bang for your buck on an acre, we really do want to have uh, all that residual as close to planting as possible to give us the, the widest window of control in the spring. So, you know, we'll get some control, but it, it's really kind of an academic exercise, you know, 20, 30, 40%, maybe. Uh, and that's, that's why we recommend all that, all the residual uh, at planting in the spring. 
This is Brad again. I drove from uh, from Southern Sargent County all the way to Walsh County yesterday. Are we losing the battle with water hemp? I have I'm seeing water hemp in just about every field, and it's it's hard. Some of these fields are hard. Yeah, it's 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 uh you know you don't ever want to throw in uh, uh throw in the towel or throw up the white flag, but it's certainly uh, commercially we we just see as you mentioned this part of the valley or well, southern half of the valley at least it's it's pretty disappointing or depressing to to see how much water hemp we have late in the season. The interesting thing, I mean, so for that weed, it we kind of do need to just really double down and focus on it's going to be two to three applications minimum in season with effective modes of action it's going to be expensive uh and and that's one of the reasons why it, we do have quite a bit of escapes um the other interesting thing is um if you took that drive about a month ago maybe maybe six weeks ago things were looking pretty good but it seems like in the fall when the crops stop growing the water hemp takes over the canopy that's when we finally do see just how much water hemp was actually out there uh, throughout July and August. So it's it's certainly um, not the best situation. <laughs> but I, I think we'll just need to kind of redouble some efforts. And I know some some feedback I got from the Soybean Council, for instance, is they some farmers just kind of want a simple message of tell me when to spray. And so I'll be working on some of that. We're basically for for complete season-long control, what we get in research. If you wait after 28 days after planting uh, for a post-emergence application, you're not going to win that battle. So I'll be developing some slides that you guys can use this winter to really focus in on timing, just kind of make it uh, Betty Crocker in the kitchen recipe. And if you slip from that recipe, then you're, you're going to have water hemp escapes. Joe, where this is Jeff Stockler. Where are we at with... <clears throat> kosha and the potential for uh dicamba resistance uh where where are you thinking we are with that yeah great question jeff so kosha and dicamba resistance and so you know if we go back three three four years ago i know we had identified a handful of populations across the state that we called dicamba resistant to to lower rates of dicamba than we currently use um and extend soybeans so I'm, I'm going to be talking specifically about the half pound rate. And so we had not confirmed, to my knowledge, resistance to that yet. Uh, but we certainly have a lot of concerning questions and escapes this year. And I know I'll be, uh, I'm going to have a lot of seeds sent my way from some agronomists. I, I do see now that Brian is on and I'm seeing the list. I'm assuming Brian's had similar conversations, but I know with, with my conversations, um, I've, I've, this is a very big generalization, but I've said basically draw a, a line from Devil's Lake down to Aberdeen, South Dakota, and it seems like that kind of corridor uh, have gotten quite a lot of concerning questions, pictures, phone calls. Um, if I were to generalize the, the questions I've gotten, I'd, I'd generalize it as 80% of the phone calls about dicamba failing to control kosher and soybean uh, probably the kosher was too big and even if it's four to five inches you know that may have worked in the past but it's it's becoming a tougher game so i call that too big to confirm resistance the other 20 percent, i do have some concerns with so we'll be screening this fall i i wouldn't i won't be surprised at all if we find a couple populations that are resistant to that half pound soybean rate uh, we've just had a lot of pressure with dicamba on kosher and soybeans since so what 2017 the launch of that technology so five six years now so we're going to try and, and confirm some things this winter but uh i i definitely think there's some populations out there we just need to document them i've got a question for andrew is you know back in the 60s i remember ergot being pretty endemic in our wheat especially with the waldron variety is this something that's coming back or is it, is this the last couple of years seems to have been the, the reemergence of ergot? Is it an evolution, is it a cycle or is it just the weird weather or why are we starting to see ergot back into our wheat? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so kind of dating back to 2018, I think that's when uh, ergot got put back on the radar. 
Uh, I, I don't think there's one puzzle piece that completely answers this. Um, I'll touch on varieties. You mentioned Waldron wheat. Um, you, one, one variety that was shown to be pretty susceptible to ergot. And I had a graduate student just get done in the greenhouse looking at ergot resistance and 25 commercially available spring wheat varieties. And Waldron was still the most susceptible. And everything that we have since Waldron is more resistant. So um, not sure. And I really can't say that it's a we're seeing more susceptibility in the variety. So naturally, the next thing I start looking at is what's the environment. Um, we know Urgot likes cool, wet weather, but I think the biggest driver is probably cool, wet weather in first week of June, last week of May. I think that might be indicative of why we see some Urgot. Uh, again, kind of a hunch because if we go out to Southwest North Dakota where they've had Urgot for every year, basically, um, it could be more of a production uh, issue. So it leads me to another puzzle piece about, about, about production. I just think that we just have an overabundance of grassy weeds and smooth brome, I, I'd say is our biggest carry of ergot in the entire state. Uh, if you would ask any of my colleagues in South Dakota, they would say the same thing. And knowing that smooth brome is just about in every road ditch, I think that knock limbs every there. So I, not sure if we're just seeing more or maybe maybe we're just starting to scout for more or just starting to notice it more. I'm not quite sure what the whole answer is, but we started exploring this a couple of years ago. And I'm, I, I think we have some traction on what we know about some of the varieties, uh, certainly comparing it to like Waldron. But I, I just don't I just don't know where that's at uh, as far as like this is for sure the reason why. Andrew, this is Jeff Stockler. I, I, I'd say based on my observations this year that quack grass is just as bad or worse, I think, compared to smooth brom. I mean, what, what I'm with helping with range judging practice, the sight just is tremendous with ergot in the quack grass and what smooth brome is there, I can't find much. So um, I think that's just as bad. I don't know my my grassy weeds as much, but I, my, my hypothesis could be that uh, quack grass and smooth brome probably have different heading dates. Is that is that probably true, Joe? What do you think? A little bit. Okay. Um, Maybe it depends on the situation in a lot of ways. Yeah, and they're also kind of and they are different. So I don't know the they are a good host range if it's more. I guess I shouldn't say grass family, but more if there's certain grass subfamilies that are more susceptible or not. Genus is what I'm the word I'm looking for there. When we were out at the soil field health day by um Laramore, there all the crested wheatgrass had ergot in it. So that field might have some bodies. But. So we just brought up three different grass soils. So I think that kind of speaks to the nature of the pathogen, right? So how I look at this information from like Jeff and Brad and Bailey have mentioned is you know, a lot of times I can see that certain hosts are uh, greater for ergot, and part of that could just be, you know, maybe a monoculture of the, of the grass, but uh, could be just a kind of the ergot sp a pathogen spores floating around and infecting at a certain time. So I, I, I still think that there's, I, I just think North Dakota is an ergot state, um, and then a lot of it is because when I say we have 50 grass hosts, we probably have five or six, if it's cover crop CRP mixes that are just bigger carriers of it. And it's just something with grain and we might always see these kind of fluctuations in it. Um, and I just wish I, there was a hundred percent foolproof management plan in place, but we have some suppression that we can use. Most of it that is culturally at this moment. I was just checking because uh, botanists always like to screw up my world. At one point, both crested wheatgrass and quackgrass were agropyrins, but now quackgrass is back to a limus. So they're, they're more closely related than either one is to, to smooth broom. What's your feeling on green foxtail, Joel? That could be, or Andrew, related to ergot. I don't know what the deal is, but there seems to be a lot of escape, and I hope not resistant, but green foxtail this year, we did not get very good control in Western North Dakota, at least on that this year at all, for whatever reason. There seems to, that's really seems to be a 
major issue this year. <laughs> yeah. Andrew, you want to go first on the ergot, then I can talk about the resistance. Yeah, so foxtail is reported to be an ergot host. Um, I personally have never seen it on foxtail. Uh, and, and I probably haven't been looking hard enough or trying to find it, but I, you know, comparative to what some of the other species we were talking about, I you know it's, it's probably susceptible, but timing has to be right in a lot of ways. So that's, that's kind of my take on it from a, from an ergot perspective. And Craig, as far as resistance, uh, we do have, we know of several populations of, uh, both group one herbicides and group two, and even some that's group one and group two. And so I know uh brian screens green foxtail uh every year for on um, the last five six maybe more i assume brian is still uh, conducting those those trials uh, brian if you're on it can confirm uh that'd be great but uh i know last year we had a lot of failures because of the drought uh green foxtail tends to thrive in in dry situations or might, maybe not thrive but be more difficult to kill uh, there's plenty of older research alluding to that. I know there's some also some research uh, of importance for those out west that green foxtail is actually more competitive in low pH, like four and five pH soils than more neutral and, and uh, alkaline soils. And so there's a couple of things lining up. So a lot of failures last year, uh, maybe more competitive in these low uh, pH pockets that we have, but also there is quite a lot of resistance to are group one and group two herbicides. Uh, and that's regardless of what crop we use them in, those, those two uh, classes of herbicides, we do have quite a bit of resistance. Joe, can you hear me? Yes, Brian. Uh, yes, we are still uh, screening green foxtails. So if you want to send us some uh, a sample, uh, we'll be starting that in October, November. Real quick. Um... We're seeing a lot more field penny crests up here. Do you have any idea why that is? For that for that specific weed, I'm um, besides the fact it's a winter annual. Yep. Um, so I'll find wet falls and then uh, just not doing anything in the fall will typically increase winter annual pressure. Shouldn't be anything that one shouldn't stick out more compared to like you know, horseweed and, and hawksbeard we see more of because they're more difficult to, uh, to kill, but I can't really think of field pennycrest being that much more difficult than other winter annual broadleaf weeds that would be out in the field. Now, if Sam was on, he'd tell you that's a, that's a soybean cyst nematode host. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> that's all we need. <laughs> Shit. Canada does have some group two resistant field penny crest, but I don't know that it's widespread. And I, I don't know that it's, that's an issue here. I, I think it's just a environmental thing myself. Well, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to reach out to Sam, Joe, or I, and i um, more than happy to help you if you, if you have to troubleshoot anything. So just appreciate you logging in today and uh, uh, engaging in the discussion. Yeah, thank you.